Good afternoon and welcome. That was a very quick and short introduction. But for those of you who haven't read their brochure, I'll just say a few words about Sharad. Sharad was born in the UK and then grew up in India, went back. And perhaps if I have the chronology long, wrong, he can correct it. But is at the moment in New Zealand and a doctor in the world of skin care and plastic surgery. And through this session, and as we go along, besides his writing, we'll talk a bit about some of the wonderful initiatives that have come out of that. So with that, we'll start. Um, very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Sharad. Uh, while the session has been titled just about one book of Sharad's called The Kite Flyers, which is a book that came from an earlier article and is one of his recent ones, we've also decided to integrate some of his other work. So I'm going to start by asking Sharad to tell us a bit about his early years, his training in medicine, his training in medical ethics, you have a medical law degree, and how you got to New Zealand. I think, um, I think I'm like the, just a global uh, wanderer. Um, I was born in England, like you said, and my parents came back to India. And um, I actually was in Chennai for a period, uh, so I can speak Tamil very well. Uh, Wanakam. <laughs> um, so the women at the front, uh, when I came in, I, they were astounded that I could speak Tamil. Um, so, I guess uh, by my medical work, my original training was um, in um, plastic surgery, but mainly to do with burns and trauma. Um, my work now is mostly to do with um, skin cancer, uh, but we develop cosmetics and um, skin research. My focus is a lot on um, the wellness-based uh, treatments, so we try and minimize um, procedures and do as much as we can naturally and also uh, my interest is on ethnic skin care particularly for our brown and asian skin types so we actually develop unique products specifically for our type of skin and that's something i'll be speaking about later during my talk this afternoon um, regarding my journey how i ended up in new zealand it was really an accident i think you know in some ways um, in India is a, a mix of so many cultures and religions and languages and somehow it's all held together and um, my wife is sitting in the front row so I don't know if I'm allowed to tell this story or not and still be allowed back home but um, we met when we were in Bangalore, my parents are in Bangalore although they now mostly live in New Zealand and um, so my family originally was Christian, as you probably gathered from uh, uh, surname Paul, although I would probably describe myself as uh, scientific and spiritual rather than being religious. Um, Sunita is from UP Brahman family, um, which was something for somebody who grew up in Tamil Nadu in the time of anti-Hindi riots, which features in my first book uh, to actually end up marrying somebody who spoke Hindi and no Tamil. So in actual fact, funny enough, uh, uh, she effectively got excommunicated. So we had to find somewhere which was as far away from New Zealand, uh, from India as possible. So New Zealand was the only last inhabited place. Otherwise we would be in Antarctica, which was a bit too cold. So we ended up getting there and, um, you know, it's a funny story because um, when we, uh, skin color is the least important from a genetic point of view, like what I'm going to point out later on today is that all of us genetically are the same underneath. So our unique skin colors gives us different medical problems, which I'll talk about later, but not in this session. But um, underneath we're all the same but that's the first thing people notice so 
when I went to New Zealand, I'm talking about like in 1991, so that's a long time ago, so um, countries weren't as global and there were very few immigrants, so, you know, it was very hard to settle down. But I think the important thing in life when you face setbacks, I always say, is to um, respond with your actions and not react. You know, as Indians, are often very easy to react and get angry and say, how can they... Because when I went there, I had a confirmed job offer. Because I was born in England, had a surname, Paul, obviously they thought I was a proper Englishman. So when I landed up there, the job just disappeared. But when you're young and you go to other places, you don't really know your rights or what you could do. Um, but like uh, Ranveer said, I ended up later on also doing a law degree. So I have a degree in medical law, specializing in ethics and medical law, and I have an MPhil. So what it ended up making me is full of useless information because I studied medicine, law, philosophy, ethics, so I think that helps me write books. And when did the writing start? Was it something that you did when you were younger while you were studying medicine, or did that happen later, or was it simultaneous? Yeah, I actually think, you know, the funny thing is, I think I've always written, but those days we didn't have computers and you, nothing got stored and um, you used to handwrite them because only your parents were used, the old typewriters and I don't really, I mean I actually thought, I never remember any of my early writing but the funny thing was a um, few years ago um, uh, there was an article in Time magazine which featured me because it featured me and my bookstore which we can talk about a bit later and I had some friends who, all childhood friends who were living in the UK who saw it in Time magazine and they said, oh, is this the same Sharad Paul whom we knew many years ago? So I got some emails and I had an email from a girl who said to me that when she was about nine, I gave her a poem called The Donkey. I thought that was pretty smooth for a guy to give a girl a poem at nine, even if it was called The Donkey. So I probably always wrote. <laughs> That's a really cheesy question, <laughs> see whether it was biographical. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they used to be, and it wasn't biographical, but I tell you this, the, I still remember when I was in Tamil Nadu those days, the, uh, the famous uh, uh, way of putting down a student for my uh, Tamil uh, uh, chemistry teacher used to be, Arif get the pannikar there, so that's like big donkey, which I'd never heard of anywhere else in the world, so it could be. <laughs> but when did you get published? Um, you know, I published short stories here and there, and uh, as regards my first novel, it was actually quite interesting because I first wrote um, The Cool Cut, which was actually wrote, written as Kite Flyers. Um, uh, this one as a short story called Kite Flyers, and I think it, was, it won a competition in the UK in 2001, or was runner-up, and then it was funny, it was just featured a kite flying competition set in Tamil Nadu, and people kept writing to me and wanting to know more about the characters. So I ended up making into a little novella and I didn't do much with it and I just put it in my uh, bottom drawer and being busy at work as a surgeon, you're just so busy, you didn't. Then finally, I thought, hang on, um, I think, you know, I, we used to run the bookstore, so I was looking at other stuff and I thought, well, um, I think looking at other things, I think I can write, but I don't know if you still have the proverb in Tamil, there used to be one proverb here which used to say, you know, only the crow thinks that its baby is beautiful. So I thought maybe my book is like a crow baby, that only I think it's good, but others may not think it's good. So I sent it to an agent and I said, well, what do you think, you know, is this a crow baby or not? So it was funny, 10 days later, Picador UK had bought it and then they said to me, but here's the deal, it was 10 days before the Frankfurt Book Fair and so Picado UK said, here's an offer, we'll pay you this provided you don't take the book to Frankfurt. So I spoke to my agent, I was new to it and she said to me, um, listen, if they're showing this kind of interest, we'll take it to Frankfurt and we can auction it. And I said, listen, um, a crow baby in hand is worth two in the bush, so let's just take it. So hence it was first published through Picador and then funnily enough, writers, obviously uh, people, there was some resonance uh, of that book with readers and 
internationally and in India. So I kept getting letters and the publishers kept getting, what happened to the characters? So they said, could you do an extended version of it? And I said, yeah, sure. And I thought it would be easy. But as you know, I realized later that once you've written a book, you were at a different stage in your life, you moved on. It's like you can't go back to your past. So after six months, I found I had no inspiration to get into the headspace of these characters because I'd already finished another novel. I was writing my third one and I was like having to go back to this one and I found it very, very hard. So after six months, I thought I'm going to have to say I can't do this and then suddenly I got into the headspace of the characters and it ended up flowing and it ended up getting finished and then HarperCollins got it and it's now at HarperCollins India. Speaking of crow babies and the kite flyers, do you want to share with the audience the name of the town in which it is initially <laughs> set and why that came to be? Because this is running the crow narrative. Yeah. And perhaps even read some bits from it now. All right. I'll start with this one because it was also my first novel and effectively also my third one. Um, it is set in a little fictional village just outside Salem sort of area. And the village is called... KKP, which nobody knows whether it came from KKP or whether it came from KK Pickering, who was the last uh, British uh, secretary of that area, so that you will have to find out. But I think um, I'm going to read a part of it, which I think being Tamil Nadu, where we just came back from France and probably the only other place where people feel so strongly about language. So I'm going to read... Uh, uh, chapter or a little paragraph from it, but I'd have to say uh, to non-Hindi speaking people like my wife that uh, obviously when you write fiction and non-fiction at home, you always get into trouble because people think you are saying it even if a character is saying it, so I never show anybody at home my writing till it's published because if a husband says something about a wife, they're like, he must be thinking that. Right, so this is set in the time of the Hindi anti-Hindi agitations and it's actually seen through the eyes of the narrator. So while I'm the writer, this isn't me or it could be me while I was writing the book. These are important times in Madras. The central government of India has made the learning of Hindi language compulsory. Hindi is being pushed as the new national language. Everyone has to learn Hindi in school until fifth grade. Around here many kids go to work even if they have not been to school. They can all read and write Tamil, which is their mother tongue. People are intimidated by Hindi. Government officials are changing many signs into the Hindi alphabet. I can read Hindi because I learned it at school, but I don't speak it. I don't want to speak it. I can perhaps muster up a dialect, but not proper spoken Hindi. I write in Tamil because it is a poetic language. Kumar says we dream in Tamil because it is a very quiet language. It lingers in the background of our dreams never threatening to overwhelm our imagination, unlike Hindi. Hindi is noise. Hindi cannot be used to describe what happens every day. But you definitely cannot dream in Hindi. Kumar is right. This is Madras, the bustling capital of the state of Tamil Nadu. This is the home of the Dravidian people who a year before the Aryans established the Indus Valley civilization 4,000 years ago. It is absurd that a language you cannot dream in can become your national language. Riots have broken out in the streets. There has been unrest for years, but it has now erupted like molten lava. Buses are being burnt. The radio informs us that it is bus number 93C that has been torched. A cinema which dared to screen a Hindi movie has just been firebombed. Signposts in India are being tarred black. Kumar says, we shouldn't have to speak or learn Hindi. I agree. To speak Hindi, we have to study it. It is like seeing postcards of America without going there. You see cowboys, Disneyland, pictures of Red Indians, even if just the ones that were not killed off by the white men. I'm a Dravidian from the south of India. My roots are here. I actually tried to learn Hindi, but the words won't form in my mouth. I don't want the Prime Minister to say, good, you are learning the national language. That will be like being unfaithful to Tamil. I think many people like me will live in Tamil and die in Hindi. Hindi to me is an unapproachable, ungrateful language. Outside in the street, I hear the rush of an oncoming bus. There are a lot of buses today. People come from the villages to hear MGR. He's going to speak at a political rally. He's leading the battle against this imposition of Hindi. The radio keeps us informed about the progress of MGR's motorcade. 
My hair is finally done at the barber salon and Kumar inspects my stubble. Until today, he has run a clipper over my chin after my haircut. This has been our ritual for the past three years. Time for your first shave, he declares. I feel like a big man. I wonder if I should ask my father first. But big men don't ask their fathers. Do I get the lather and everything? You bet. Kumar beams and whips out a gleaming knife. I turn my face to the left side and the cold metal presses against my cheek. One must always shave the left side first. Shaving the right side first brings bad luck, Kumar says. Maybe I should have the clippers, I stammer. Nonsense. A good shave is the essence of a gentleman. I look up and on the ceiling I see the motto of Kulkat painted in bright red letters. God made man, but Kulkat made him gentleman. I'm almost one now. I smile nervously. I lean back and Kumar lathers cream on my cheeks. He works up a lather with a brush. Mounds of cumulus flow from his brush while he steadies his head with a melange of gentleness and warmth. I stop talking as he nears my throat. He can't concentrate on the contours of the cumulus if I keep talking. I reason it might be dangerous. Shaving forms looks like a cloud, he says, reading my mind. Dreams belong in the clouds. Anything else among them, like airplanes, doves, storks, eagles, is too intrusive. They push thoughts in wrong directions, except dreams and kites, he says. Great. Um, the story is about three friends, Kumar, Raman, and Lakshmi. And one of the boys is in love, of course, with Lakshmi. And the story progresses. Uh, I won't give away the whole plot because you must buy the book and get it autographed by Sharad, who's still here. But at one part, there is a whole uh, interesting section about the life of eunuchs. And my question to you is, how did you have such a detailed insight? Did it come from patients who were eunuchs? Did it come from uh, people you met? I mean, it's, it seems quite fascinating because it's a large chunk of the book is about eunuch lifestyle and yeah. how they get castrated and so forth. Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, as a writer, I think I'm always a storyteller. So as a writer, you're always interested, you're a people person, you're always interacting with people. So I think one of the things I really like is interacting with uh, every section of society and even the common man and even as a doctor that's been my philosophy. I mean, I worked in government hospitals, yes, you would be a part of it, of course. As a doctor, I think my privilege is the daily narrative I have where people are willing to open their lives to me. And I think to me, I hold it as a privilege and I'm humbled by the fact that I can tell you something and you will follow it. I think too often in medicine, we see it as a right and it becomes ego-based where I'm telling you, you better do it. No, you should be free to question me, but it's very important that I give you advice like I treat yourself or your family. So just to give you an advice, I was driving in the inside, I was driving in the car here to the, today to the driver and so it was like talking to the drivers, anybody just see what their opinion of Chennai is. And I was just actually thinking, you know, today is a lot warmer than yesterday. So I said to him, what do you think about the weather in Chennai? He says, so kulure, kulure, sir, ramba kulure. I said, yeah, you know, Uti, uh, I thought he was talking about Uti. No, no, he's saying this is Chennai, you don't know how cold it was this morning. And I was thinking, and then you walk around the streets, right? Everybody's got earmuffs like they're doing some uh, work. There's some philosophy here that believes that if you just give, cover your ears and sort them out, everything else gets sorted. So it's like in the morning, no one's covered their head, no one's covered everywhere else. Shirt even is half torn, but the ears are fully covered. So, yes, yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, it's just from interact different people as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, medical uh, life. Yeah. One of the things I noticed while reading the kite flyers is that uh, there are sort of detailed descriptions of Indian, perhaps more Tamil things. Uh, you know, you describe in detail an entire Tamil wedding yes. through the eyes of uh, yes. the narrator and so yeah. forth. So my question to you is, when you write, were you thinking of this for a particular non-Indian or a Western audience? No, actually, funnily enough, um, I actually write really for myself. I always say in other things, it's my soul medicine. So I really um, write for myself and then if anyone else thinks it's any good, that's okay. So uh, really, uh, in fact, some ways the criticism of my books have been that they are too real. Um, so when I, like for example, the second book which is set in Tibet, um, my publisher said to me, 
you know, we love your writing, but why don't you write about China? You know, that's where the money is. And I was like, I can't write about China because I've trekked in the Himalayas, I know Tibet, and I have to write about Tibet. So I think you have to write about what's real to you. Um, I think it's different if you were writing a thriller or a romance, something you were just setting it as a plot. But yeah, no, these. Affair, I think that's the reason why it kept getting extended because people actually are convinced. The last time I came for a book launch, when it was in its original form, people wanted to go to Cool Cut and have a haircut. And I said, "This is made up," and they go, "No, no, no, no. We know what's made up. This politics is real. The social mores are real. Just tell us where it is." Yeah. So maybe there is one somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. So tell us about the Tibet book, To Kill a Snow Dragonfly. How did that come to be and what it's about? Yeah, I mean, this actually started off totally on its own. Like, it didn't have a backstory, like, um, it was just totally. Uh, I, I, there was a. See, one of the things in medicine is how you. What we don't realize is the power of the mind also affects our health. So, what we do, this is often neglected in Western medicine. So, so to some degree, I research skin cells, aging, um, uh, cancers, and what you know is that at a molecular level, at a cellular level, if you look at the NR of two pathway, um, which is the antioxidant response, to make it simply, the same response which is stimulated by the cells happens in emotional stress, physical stress, like injury or cancer or infection. So, in other words, your body uses the same mechanism to deal with all this. In other words, if you are chronically stressed because you are being abused every day, or you are ill, or you've got cancer, or you have unhealthy lifestyle, you can't have good skin, because it fundamentally just reflects it. So what I found was, what astounded me was to a large degree, the stress management should also be a daily big part of our lives. But you know, life is stressful, and my life is stressful because I'm operating in very difficult areas, things can go wrong, and in Western countries you have a problem with litigation and that type of stuff of being a surgeon. So when you do a, a work in very stressful environments, you often think, how do you handle stress? So what appealed to me was the Buddhist philosophy in dealing with it, which was really, you know, like the Dalai Lama would say, there are only two ways you deal with stress. There are only two types of problems. Problems in life you can control and problems in life you can't. So if there are problems, and I think this is great advice, so, um, and uh, that's why I'm mentioning it here, is if you have a problem you can control, there's no point stressing or whinging about it. Make the change because you, it's in your power to make the change. No point complaining about your job if you really hate it. Quit it. Have the courage to do something else. If you are not passionate about what you do, quit it, do something else that you're passionate about. I've never done anything for money except done everything for passion, and then you find that the money flows anyway. But conversely, there are some things in life you can't control, and that's typically like other people's opinion of you, um, what, you what your competitors think about you, adult children's opinion, you may have things you want your children to do, they have their own lives to lead. But those things, there's no point stressing because you can't change them anyway. So the moral of the story is no stress, then you end up being chilled, which I think is my attitude to life. So I actually like that Buddhist aspect of it, and I was exploring a bit more. And many years ago, probably when it was nobody had border crossings, we trekked in the Himalayas and we went to the Tibetan border through Nepal. So I did have insight. Again, meeting with common people there, I had an insight into their lives. So, if I may, I might like to read, seeing that you mentioned a wedding yeah, and a absolutely. Tibet. absolutely. It's delightful. I'm going to read you a little part of it. Do you just want to tell, share with the audience the sort of uh, meta picture about the yeah. grandfather and the yeah. two grandchildren? So, basically, this story, um, To Kill a Snow Dragonfly, is set in Tibet and India, but the backstory is it's seen in a remote Tibetan village at the time of the Chinese occupation. China had occupied Lhasa earlier, but people in this village don't know it because they're very high up in the Himalayas and they're very remote. And these are seen through, the, through siblings growing up through that sense of turmoil when all, because their grandfather is religious, he's like a monk, he's a lama, so their entire uh, lifestyles get disrupted, people get thrown in prison, so on and so forth. So it's seen through that. And as a lot of Tibetans did, they end up uh, in India. So this story happens when um, this girl, it actually starts with the interesting, she has a mole on her left cheek, and in Tibet, if you have a mole on your left cheek, it's considered for a girl very inauspicious, so therefore your husband will die an early death. So 
she's trying to get the mole removed. So that was a little bit part of my medical work. But the thing in Tibet is where she was in the religious sex, surgery is forbidden. So uh, she can't have it removed surgically. So in the end, she comes to Bombay and she finds a plastic surgeon. And of course, he removes the mole. Like I say, there is no greater indication for elective surgery than saving your own life because he ends up marrying her. So this part of it is about the wedding. So, and the parents finally, China has relaxed some travel rules and they're able to come down for the wedding. But because the snow is snow dear to them and all their life has been in the snow and there's no snow in Bombay, they carry a little bit of snow in a flask so these people can see snow after many years. Okay, so father and mother disembark and go through the usual rigmarole of customs checks. Father cannot understand why they call it customs when they do not even ask him his name in Tibetan. All they look at it as his, at his new passport with a photograph that does not look like him. He tells the customs officer that he's here for his daughter's wedding. He asks the customs man if he has a daughter and if she is married. He can see the man isn't interested in small talk with strangers. Life in a big city like Bombay must be different, he thinks. They walk out of the concourse into heat, which blasts upon them like a furnace. Snow wouldn't survive here, father thinks. He's amazed to see millions and millions of ramshackle huts housing innumerable slum dwellers. The air is thick and smoke with smoke and his mouth feels clogged. He cleans his throat noisily and spits. He can now understand why people he can see spitting on the ground here, why he can see people spitting on the ground here. He closes his eyes and whispers a prayer. They're here in Bombay, the only city in the world where poverty isn't ashamed of its existence. In fact, no one is ashamed of anything in Bombay. From the first moment in the airport, his father knows he is charged with an important task, to help mother arrange the wedding, to come up with a function that will give the Tibetan family some dignity and bring back a smile to the face of a beautiful young girl who may or may not be his biological daughter. He tries to hide his emotion as he holds tight his suitcase he has brought with him from Tibet. Mother is carrying the bag with all the things she will need for the wedding. Stop, she commands the taxi driver, I must buy some flowers. She rushes out to buy jasmine and lotus flowers. She chooses small white jasmine flowers with impossibly strong dehydrated scents and large red lotus blooms. While they're watching mother buying flowers, father feels Bunsheng squeezing his hand, like some biofeedback reflex that makes his heart miss a beat. It must be all the pollution, he says, as his eye begins to water. From the windows of the taxi, father takes in the factory's belching smoke, telephone wires, the roar of suburban trains tearing past, and the relentless staccato of auto rickshaws weaving their way in and out of traffic. Catching a glimpse of Bombay is like taking a peek into two lives, he thinks, two rebirths within the same city. The poor soul who lives in the slums is doomed to dwell there in this life where the shelter is partial, the heat oppressive, and the shadows are long. But in the very same, same landscape, he can see luxurious cars and gleaming skyscrapers which symbolize the promise of rebirth. Perhaps the skyscrapers represent the dreams of the slum dwellers who live in the city's underbelly, a place where the sun never reaches because the shadows of their dreams are too long. And when these tall dreams die, he ponders, will scavengers rush to the scene and devour their carcasses? Or will karmic patience be virtue enough to keep everyone at bay? He looks up at a balcony which must be at least 100 feet high. He notices that wooden planks have been put in place to scaffold the rusting iron balustrade with its pointed stake-like sarons. Colorful saris and some skirts hang off the railing, sparkling in the bright sun that also makes them fade. By now, mother is back from a flower-buying saute and that returns father's thought to the taxi. For all this immediate effort to feel life of the city where his daughter lives, he feels like a total stranger in this place. The nearby beach is crowded with people who come here to escape the searing heat and the bustle of the city. Lobsang says that less than two weeks ago, a three-meter shark had been caught there. Even such a hermetical beast could not resist the lure of Bombay. It made the evening news and good shark fin soup at the Chinese restaurant. Such is the magnetism of Bombay. All creatures are drawn into its murky core. Father feels lightheaded from inhaling the salty breath of the sea. Or perhaps all this magnetism is messing with his physiological compass, he speculates. The man with the bulky camera is getting ready to start filming the wedding. There is a video shot being shot as well. 
people are posing at various places about the hotel. The light is harsh and the smiles rather artificial. Or maybe it's the other way around. Guests talk in short sentences and silence hangs between the exchanges. All hotels are the same, Lobsang thinks, even if this one is called lucky. In true um, Tibetan weddings, the ceremony has its preordained scripts and the queue is like a local Hindi movie. It makes complete sense. Why would a different dramaturgical scenario apply to a commoner's wedding in Bombay? Mother has gone to great effort with her screenplay. Act one, scene one, the arrival. The bridal party arrives. Bancheng is atop a white mare called Tashi, which means good luck. Truly, one can never have too much good luck, even if one is ensconced in the lucky hotel. The reins of the white mare are held back by two turbaned attendants. Their turbans are gold and the reins are as red as blood. These men help Bancheng dismount. Bancheng refuses to dismount and is finally persuaded by father to get down from the horse. The choreographed inveiglement takes several minutes. Finally, Bancheng alights but tries to flee and is caught by the two turbaned guards. At this point, Lobsang is getting a little worried if Bancheng is having second thoughts, but mother assures him that everyone is being true to the script. A bride is not supposed to look overly eager, especially during a betrothal or risk ill luck. The turbaned captors carry a kicking and screaming Bancheng towards the reception hall. Mother places a stainless steel pot of milk and butter at her daughter's feet. Father whispers to Lobsang this is to signify arrival at the bridal chamber. Bancheng does not seem to care much for this ritual and kicks the pot of milk away. Some of the liquid splashes onto the carpet and one or two drops end up on father's face. He slaps Bancheng and Bancheng wails loudly. Mother assures Lobsang that the bride has to cry at a wedding to bring good fortune. And Bancheng had no reason to cry and hence a slap had been incorporated into the screenplay. This touch of script writing brilliance is all for Bancheng's own good, mother said. Besides, it was her fault. She had been told to get some glycerin from the nearby movie studio to help shed some crocodile tears, but had forgotten to do so. Thank you, that was great. Um, can we now talk a bit about your other activities with the Bachi overall name? And I'm very curious to know where Bachi comes from. Okay, Bachi in Italian means kisses. Right. right. So, um, but how it, the name actually originally came about was um, we had a chain of bookstore um, cafes which was called Bachi Lounge. It really stood for Books, Art, Coffee, Inc. or Incorporated, so it was called Bachi. So, uh, we're very proud that in a crowded cafe market like in Auckland, we won Top Shop beating all cafes in 2008. And we were the only, or we probably still are, the only bookstore anywhere in the world to feature in all the international editions of Time magazine. So that was a venture which was really to put profits into programs for poor children. One day a week I don't work in medicine, but I teach creative writing for children who can't read and write properly. So the bookstore used to fund that. So that was very dear to me, so that was Bachi Lounge. So as the lease expired for a store, actually Bachi Lounge in Auckland is no more, but I have another business which we develop cosmetics, research-based stuff based on the motto is really ancient Indian wisdom to modern skin, so it's a biotech company and we manufacture out of Los Angeles. So to keep the name that Bachi, because that had a special meaning to me, that is Bachi Cosmetology and my foundation, the charitable foundation which works with these kids in schools called the Bachi Foundation. So people generally know me, if they think Bachi group, they think it's Sharad Paul or vice versa. And tell us also about your involvement. You were talking to me earlier in a UN panel and so forth that is involved with certain uh, children's and he, he, education issues. Yeah, I think that really happened more by accident in the sense that, like I said, a lot of things you do, you really do the things you're passionate about and um, things just flow from there. So. I, um, this was a grassroots effort because it's common sense. He has a doctor and I do a lot of pro bono work. So we do about 7,000 uh, free consultation procedures a year. Uh, that's just my free work. It doesn't include the rest. So even by Indian individual doctor standards, that's a massive amount. So I was visiting the Hinduja hospital in Bombay and with four doctors in their skin clinic, they only saw 12,000 patients the whole year. So then I thought, wow, I didn't realize I was that busy because you don't really worry about what other people are doing. 
So anyway, a lot of the people I work with from the poorer sections of society, what I found astounding is at my daughter's school, the book she was reading at year six, they were reading at year three. So there was actually a three-year reading and writing gap even in Western countries between the wealthy and the uh, poor. I mean, we don't have real poor like we have in India, but what I mean is it's still a p more poverty of the mind. So it really was the fact that a lot of these were Pacific Islander Maori or also some Indian immigrants who couldn't integrate. And what we found is, so I actually started visiting them to make reading and writing fun. So I run creative writing classes and what actually happened is a teacher ended up doing a PhD on the pro project because they found that, which is common sense, if you uh, make things creative, then people improve their general performance. So what we found, I was working on their creative writing, making them write stories and the school which won our story writing competition which was restricted to these poor schools I build a library for the school each year so what happened is but what it showed is these schools actually improved their math and science so but because this teacher did a PhD the next thing I had a call from UNESCO saying would I be their literacy advisor so I said why not what's another job so uh, that's another one of my honorary roles really so it's yeah. really literature for life Yes, that's it, yes. And on Very that, much. can we open it up for questions from the audience, if there are any? There's one here and one there. I just have one small factual, point out on factual error. MGR never came out openly against Hindi. I was an active participant in the Hindi, anti-Hindi agitation in, during college times. He never came out openly on Hindi. You have to read the book to say what he said at the speech. I didn't come to that part. Oh, so yeah. this is the narrator. Oh, just read out, sir. Like I said to you, it's fiction and it's the narrator's viewpoint. Yeah, I know I'm aware of the DMK, DMK thing at the time, yeah. Um, my question is to both of you, uh, Mr. Ranveer as well as Mr. Dr. Sharad Paul. As both of you are active in both uh, writing and in the art form and at the same time doing something as a cause for society too. So, uh, and your artistic work and the work that you do for society are closely linked to each other. Which would you assign as the cause and which would you assign as the effect? As a, as a writer, do you feel a moral, you know, a, a responsibility to create the hope that you establish through the work? Or do you think that your work is a reflection of the work that you do? Your, is your writing uh, a reflection Shadad of the work? Right. I, I think See, I, I would um, really consider myself a social entrepreneur rather than a businessman. Or, um, and I think, um, so really I think my uh, message and also my philosophy is just to do the things you're really passionate about. So I'm passionate about books and writing, hence everything I do has a direct link. I'm not doing something purely as a business which I don't enjoy. So I research skin, I'm passionate about it, as you'll see in my skin talk later today. So that's how my skin work came about in medicine. So my work in schools is a direct extension of what I do. My free work in medicine is a direct extension of what I do. So I think, uh, to answer your question, neither. I think at heart, I am a humanitarian and I'm a, a social entrepreneur. So you want to help people in society who are not as fortunate as I am to have the same opportunities or be most importantly to be able to dream. So one of the things in the same Kite Flyers book we're talking about, when we're talking about kites, there's another thing which says dreams belong in the clouds. If not, we'll not move mountains to reach them. You know, and I think everybody needs to be able to dream, but sometimes because of social mores or caste, whatever, that's taken away from you. And I think I feel very strongly that, you know, I'm lucky or I've been strong enough mentally to battle adversity. And I think it's important that everybody has that. Last question, ma'am. Uh, I would like to appeal to you, uh, you know, when you said about uh, creative writing, you teach creative writing to children, like uh, why, uh, if you can put some of your, uh, maybe your worksheets or your ideas or whatever you ha uh, your uh, way of uh, teaching is, if you could put it online, like you know the, for example that Azim Premji Foundation, they have put some of their uh, resources which are uh, free, available online so that people, like I am a teacher and uh, maybe uh, all of us are not so creative. 
so we can take them and we can uh, implement those in our uh, in schools and you know you have a much wider reach than what you can do as a single person there are so many i mean millions of people can uh, follow those ideas and benefit like you said it has improved them the children uh, overall uh, you know academics improved when you taught them creativity yeah. so so many more can benefit other than you individually going and doing it Absolutely. to one school. Um, I, I think, you know, that happens around the areas where I am, but certainly I think that's a good suggestion. Thank you for that. And, you know, feel free to email me. If you just go to my website, just sharatpaul.com, uh, it says get in touch. You can email me like that. Otherwise, they're Facebook, Twitter, all this sort of stuff. But actually, last year I was at the Think Fest where, um, of course, I met Azim Premji and uh, people like that. So I do know Rishab quite well and Azim. And we did briefly talk about the foundation, but we didn't end up talking about this work that I do. So um, I might just reconnect with them and say that, you know, you said that and it would, would they be interested? I mean, if they're interested, I'd be yeah, more than yeah. happy. I have used some of Ajim Premji's yeah. uh, foundations, their worksheets, sure. you know, they're excellent and yeah. uh, my children and me have benefited a lot. So that's why I thought, why sure, don't you sure. also join uh, it? I'll actually yeah. contact them and say, yes. if they're interested, yes, I'm more than yes. happy to put it yeah. up. They're passionate about education. Sure. Great. Uh, before we just end the session, one last question from me, uh, Sharad. What does the future hold? More of what you're doing? More books? Are you already working on something? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, uh, like, I think, you know, you have to keep doing something to be good at it. Uh, I think it, I use the analogy, it's like tennis player or people talking about the 10,000 hour rule and all that type of stuff. And if you think about how did somebody become a Tendulkar or a Federer or whatever, they had to practice four hours a day, whatever, for years. Uh, so, in anything, if you don't, if I didn't write every day, then you don't get any good. So many days I write, and you know you're writing rubbish because you're not on form, and you put it in the bin, but you still keep writing. So actually, I almost finished another novel, and all, there's also another non-fiction book almost done, so it'll probably come out within the next year. Yeah. Next year, Lit for yeah, Life. Yeah. And on that note, thank you very much for it's being with us and sharing. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.